Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, a bald explorer, and I'm out on another exploration. And today, I'm very, very lucky because I'm standing in a 1930s Brighton tram. Well, uh, it may not look 100% like the 1930s Brighton tram when they were running, but it soon will. And I'm joined by Guy Hall Good morning, from Richard. Brighton <coughs> Tram 53 <laughs> Society. You have it correct, sir. Well done. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really honoured because mm. I did a walk. Now, viewers may remember I did a walk around uh, the Wiston Estate up here at Chantonbury Ring um, or Chantonbury Hill at the bottom here. And um, I happened to spy the tram that's, that's outside, right, yeah. which mm. is uh, in a sad old state. A very sad state, I'm sorry, yes. And, <laughs> um, and then you must have seen that film because you said, hey, do you want to know what goes on in our secret uh, sheds? Well, I exaggerated about the tunnels, Richard, and I apologise for that. You know, Well, it's just the fact that a lot of people walk past and don't realise what's happening here, yeah. which is good in a way because it's not to sound too private, but we don't really want trespassers. No. And it's a working farm. Yes, so of we course. have to be careful. Yeah. So we are we're in a shed on a farm uh, near Chantonbury Ring, and this magical transformation is happening. So as I say, I'm standing in a tram. Tell what what tram are we in? Well, we're in the very last tram built in Brighton, which is Tram Fifty Three. And it was built about 1936-37, you, you can argue about the date, but basically it was built by Brighton Corporation for their tram system and within two years unfortunately was out of service. So it didn't, it didn't last very long and it's been what stuck in a, in a shed all that time? Well what happened, it, a couple of them were sold as sheds when the system finished, which was 1939, um, and then this became a shed at Partridge Green for many years. So that's, I mean that's just interesting in itself, it's sold as a shed, I guess yeah. because it's a shed-like shape. Well, there was no interest because of the design, without getting into big details, it's very old-fashioned tram design. No one wanted it, so the corporation, to make some money, sold bits. They yeah. sold the chairs. A lot of the chairs became garden furniture. Oh, right. And <laughs> uh, four or five of these new bodies, which are called the F-Class, which I'll maybe describe later, were sold as sheds. And this sat out in uh, Partridge Green till about 1978. And you do see that in, in some of the films of the 50s, don't you, where somebody's got it's used as a chicken coop or uh, in the... Um, uh, not, I don't think it was a tram. I think it was an old train in in the Tipfield Thunderbolt. You oh know? yes, it's somebody's yeah. somebody's house, and I you know you can quite actually see somebody living in one of these. Well, we've had think. a few suggestions. We'd like <laughs> it to run. Yes. I, I, I'm from that generation that remembers double deckers. If yes. you that. so, said. So you said you just said there you'd like it to run. So that's the aim. You're restoring this oh, tram yeah. Yeah. so that it will. It's not just going to sit here as a project which you and some other people, which we'll find out about in a second. It's mm. going to. It's going to run. Well, in the background, you can't see him off. Electrician Steve is working hard, but. Uh, all along here, the rewiring's been done, and the next stage will be the air brakes, and then the truck, and it will be ready. Good gracious. So how long, to, yeah. to, to, when did you acquire it? How long's it been? <laughs> What's the journey? Well, the, the journey, I like that. You know, the journey was in about late 2009, I wanted to make a model of a Brighton tram, because I'm that sort of guy. And I remember seeing a picture of this tram from the late 80s, and it was somewhere on a farm. So long story, I asked someone at work, he said, I know someone, a local historian, you put me onto the farmer. So I came here in December 2009 and thought it would be a heap of nothing, to be very honest. And it was actually restorable. And I had one of those light bulb moments in my life, which is very sad. And I thought, we need to do something. And as I said to you earlier, Richard, the first thing I did when I got home, I asked my wife if I could do this. <laughs> because it was going to take a lot of time. Yes, and I wanted to live. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've set up a society and you've got yeah. charity status. Yes. Once we'd started and we thought it was viable, then the important thing was to get sort of legitimacy. Now, if you want to get grants and things, you've got to be established. Yes. And the big thing with the charitable status is we get gift aid. So twice a year, we get a rebate, we get money back. So to put something like this from a reasonably dilapidated state back into yeah. uh, 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 on a museum that people could actually ride on, yeah. what sort of costs would you be looking at over that in period? human or financial <laughs> <laughs> well i guess in human costs it's uh, it's just pure love well it, yeah giving I, your life i'd to like it. to think so let's say financially i think it would be about hundred thousand pounds wow. now let's say the tram's about sixty thousand and the mechanical side about 40. right so it's, a, it's, it's a huge commitment to do that so um, we've raised we've used about 60 already so we're all two well, two thirds of the way through Wow, that's impressive, though, yeah. isn't it? So you've got the society which people mm. can join yep. and they can donate to, which is very important to help. Yes, you. please donate. <laughs> yes. 
Um, and I'll put links to your yeah, society you. and all of that so that people can do that. So what have been some of the problems when you, I mean, I'm sure it's problems, a myriad of problems. problems yeah. trying to Actually, I'll tell you the biggest one yeah. is that because of the age of the vehicle, it's got lots of wood screws in. When the wood screw rusts, what's it do? Expand. Right. And trying to get the remnant of the wood screw out without damaging the wood has proved lots of fun. And the second thing apart from that, sourcing wood wasn't a problem. We've got a fantastic carpenter called Adrian Vaughan who helps us out and he knows the style of wood. Um, I think it's persistence, not being yeah. funny. It was getting information. Information's out there. You can go to museums and the Bluebell have been great and the Kreitz Tram Museum have been really good. So we sought professional advice early on. That's very important. Yeah. Um, I think it's just persistence. You know, the wood screws was a pain, yes. And I think it's having the courage to actually start taking things off. Yes. Not knowing what you're doing. No, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and you did, uh, you mentioned something and I can't remember before we were filming that you took a whole load of things apart and you forgot to oh, label them. Well, that's the biggest lesson was that what you thought was a very important part a few weeks later was matchwood. <laughs> um, well, I think it was when we got to the tram seat, say like the metal sides yes. and all that, they were falling off. So it didn't take much to take them off. But as I mentioned to you earlier, the, the whole body's bolted onto a metal subframe. And to actually jack that up and take it off, it's like, who undoes the screw first? Yes. <laughs> because we hadn't done it. But we were very careful. I don't want to present the image of bungling amateurs. We always got the right advice. And we had enough members who knew their stuff. Yes, and that must be so, something that the, that the membership is really good for. Because I know you mentioned to me that there hmm. were people for, of a certain age who remember There's and, a few. and, yeah, and yeah. have... Um, old expertise like you get with the railway uh, preservation societies people yes. who worked on it or know people who've worked on it or have got records of it and all this information is not left hundreds of years behind the scenes it's it's still within living memory well the one problem we had there's no plans left they were probably burnt during the war at lewis road so right. the first thing was we could utilize what was on the tram and then we scale photographs and things like that as regards the construction, I mentioned this guy, Adrian, where well, he's a superb chip. He understands the style of construction because yes. he's worked on gypsy caravans, things like that. Oh, right. Oh, um, right. We're very lucky with Steve. Steve has adapted himself to the way of the tram wire, which is a deep philosophical concept I won't go into. <laughs> um, and then things like the air the problem, it's got air brake system, but it's actually drawing the plan up at the moment. You've got people who can work on it. Yes. We've restored the compressor out there, but it is, they, the, the stuff's around, but you really have to search. So we're very grateful to museums like Kreitch. Who deal with this every day yes locally yes some lovely people have stepped forward um but it is the trouble is of course the guys who worked in it are long since dead so sometimes it really is uh, reverse engineering right yeah and um, with guesstimate involved <laughs> so. when it was running hmm. uh, i mean I've, I've looked at the outside of it and, and hmm. um you know it's quite a big building and you have a, a big um, a big vehicle rather and you'd have passengers on the top as That's well right, as yeah. inside here we're in the main Saloon. Saloon. Yeah. Saloon. There was a, you know, there was a certain prestige. I know you said to me this was when it was designed. It was already an obsolete design. It's old fashioned. But yeah. um, when you see the pictures of these things, and mm. I know you've told me about the upholstery that comes in oh, here, yeah, yeah. the luxury and the attention to detail that people had back in those days, yes, compared yeah. to. The, the sort of nylons and the, uh, um, I suppose, the sort of more bland style that we have today. I think there's a big reason was that craftsmanship was cheap in those days. Right. Now, the reason I say 53 is obviously, it's the last of the line of coach building going back to old stagecoaches. Yes. So in those days, you still had plenty of guys who'd work at a reasonable rate who would know how to do this well. And the inside certainly is all varnished mahogany and it will be very beautiful. It's yeah. quite stunning, you know. But um, it was because that was around at the time. But really, even by the late 30s, that was beginning to fade. If you looked at a railway carriage in the same period, plastic starting to creep in and right. other things. You know, yes. This is the last of the handmade things. Yes, but that gives it a certain magical, romantic quality, doesn't it? It does until you actually take it apart and realise another thing actually matches. One end is slightly different from the well, other. You see, yeah, I suppose you're seeing it, so it, you're seeing it from the very practical... <laughs> yeah. re producing it all i'm just uh, thinking no, of, of the from the right. passenger experience sitting in um, a more luxurious environment than plastics and and all of that yeah that's a very good point because um say it's all carved mahogany you've got things like this which is decorative feature so when you sat down there's lots of very lovely varnish you would work there were curtains in here as well if yeah. it's too sunny wow and though it was someone said to me recently though it's planned as a public service vehicle to make money 
a lot of stuff was put on top of that. Yes, you're yes. quite right. And it was done to a very high standard. To give you an example, we have new panels fitted for the ceiling. Now, they're veneered bird's eye maple. It's cost us the grand and a half just for the ceiling panels. Wow. But that's what they had. It so there's pride. Strong. There is, you know, there's a... You high can't, standard. Yes, yeah. high standard. And, yeah. and, and uh, I guess, a, a municipal pride of your... Very much so. Yeah. You know, I mean, to give you another example, at the end, so you'd have a little maker's plate and it had the number of the tram and made by the tramways department, Lewis Road, little transfer. We got one of those. Wow. And you don't have to put that, but people did. Yes. You know? Um, How many people would you get on a, a tram? Well, these would seat about 52, I think. You'd have long bench seats like the underground down here. Upstairs, you have the garden furniture mentions where the seat goes back and forth. But there was no limit to standing. So as many people as you could cram on. Gosh. So as you said earlier, a yeah. COVID-friendly vehicle. COVID-friendly <laughs> vehicle, absolutely. Uh, but it was designed to make money and get people from A to B, and it did it very well. Started in 2009. Yeah. We're recording this in 2020. When do you think it'll be finished and be running? Well, that's a question. I reckon the body will be finished in a year, as, uh, quite seriously. We've got to raise money for the truck. Now, the truck is the thing it sits on, which is the motors and wheels. We've got one sitting outside, but that needs about 35 grand's worth of work. Where to run? Well, that's a big thing. We're talking to Brighton Corporation, uh, Brighton Council, sorry, Corporation's old fashioned, and Ambly Museum expressed an interest. With COVID at the moment, I must admit, I don't know what's happening. No. But we're pressing on because we think when we've got a finished product, people are going to want that vehicle. Oh, definitely. But we would love it to run in Brighton if possible. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Uh, because I think part of the city, that's yes. all. It was made by Brightonians and it really should go back there. But it will be the practicalities of someone who's prepared to invest in a tramway museum. Yeah. Well, I'd love to come back in a year's time and, and see how you've progressed. And, uh, well, I might have a clean t-shirt then as well. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know. uh, yes, I think in quite seriously a year's time, you'll notice that all of this will be finished and the upstairs will have seats, it will have handrails, the destination. How exciting. Yeah. Absolutely thrilling. It will look very beautiful. Well, um, do leave a comment, ladies and gentlemen, if you um, ha have anything to add to this or if you want to become a member of your society. Yeah, we have a website. Um, um, the link will be down below. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, um, give us a thumbs up and all the rest of it. It's been an absolute joy to come and see much, it. Thank you very much, And I've had a Hello. lovely cup of tea and some biscuits and uh, a, a private tour as well. So well, If you come and work, you get the biscuits and tea for free. <laughs> so brilliant. So well done and, and good luck. With Thank it you very going. much, Richard. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to be uh, fantastic to see it up and running. Don't forget to follow, like and subscribe, become a patron, support what I do, and I'll bring you some more of these interesting and quirky places that I go to. Thank you. <laughs> Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>